Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Vaughn Lanier, and I am the HR Service Center Consultant at CoAdvantage. CoAdvantage is the lead provider for payroll, benefits, risk, and human resources. Today, we are presenting Solving the Mystery of Workplace Investigations. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We'd love to hear from you, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type, type them in the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll bring them up towards the end of the presentation during our questions and answers. Today's webinar will also be available online after this live session, and next we will go to our legal disclaimer. This webinar is intended to provide general best practices, employment guidance, um, co-advantage does not render legal advice. This webinar was not prepared by attorneys, and the delivery of this webinar does not constitute the provision of legal counsel. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Vaughn Lanier. I'm the HR Service Center Consultant at CoAdvantage, and I have my co-presenter, Daniel Mater. He is our HR Specialist with the HR Service Center here at CoAdvantage, and I will also show our contact information towards the end of the webinar. Just to tell you a little bit about CoAdvantage, CoAdvantage is a top 10 professional employer organization. We help small and mid-sized businesses by handling their human resources needs, payroll, benefits, risk management, and HR administration. We serve nearly 4,500 clients and approximately 90,000 employees, and we are still growing. Today, our agenda will talk about why it's important to conduct a workplace investigation in a timely manner. We'll also touch on some of the ramifications of not doing investigations when an allegation is brought to your attention. Then we'll go into specifics, which is who should conduct the investigation and the how-to. We'll talk about the importance of documentation throughout the process. We'll talk about confidentiality and the kinds of questions you should ask to get the most reliable information about the situation or behavior you're investigating. Also, we'll talk about determining whether inappropriate or wrongful behavior has occurred and also what to do about it. Lastly, since a workplace investigation can sometimes be emotionally a charged process, We'll talk about monitoring the situation and supporting your staff going forward. Okay, so let's talk about what constitutes a complaint. When an employee makes an informal or formal complaint, the employer should take immediate steps to stop the alleged conflict, protect involved parties, and begin investigations. The complaint could be received in different ways. It could be um, subtle statements about workplace or supervisor. It can be an offhand comment from employee directly to or overheard by a supervisor about inappropriate conduct that has occurred. Um, it can be, uh, again, written or verbal communication from employees specifically complaining about discrimination, harassment, or other objectionable conduct. Um, the employee verbally states he or she has generally been treated badly or unfairly. It could be that the manager reports that the inappropriate acts or misconducts have occurred. And it also can be complaints submitted through a published policy that you have in place on how to submit those complaints. Um, it can also be comments made outside of the workplace between friends, um, kind of those just between us or off the record type of comments. But um, under many laws, for example, Title VII, ADA, which is Americans with Disability Act, the Age Discrimination Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, as well as some state and local non-discrimination laws, encourage employers that they are obligated, legally obligated, to investigate those complaints of harassment, discrimination, retaliation in a timely manner. Um, so the last thing that constitutes a complaint is sometimes we get those EEOC charges in the mail or also um, 
being served with the lawsuit. So those are also items that can constitute as a complaint. Responsiveness to a complaint and an investigation will not only yield the best information and evidence, but it will also enhance both the investigators and the employer's credibility. Investigations can help the organization identify and resolve any internal problems before they become widespread. Given that every complaint has the potential to become a lawsuit, employers should investigate every case in a manner in which it can be presented to a court of law if necessary. As potentially destructive as investigations can be, they must be prompt, thorough, and effective to ensure everyone's protection. So with that being said, let's talk about why and when to conduct an investigation. Federal and state harassment, discrimination, and safety laws mentioned earlier impose legal duty on the employer to investigate employer-related complaints. Um, it can include office conduct. It can be for cause termination, require fair and thorough investigations. Um, obligations to shareholders may impose duty to investigate claims to determine or limit that potential liability. And also, of course, because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to provide a safe work environment. And I don't know if you ever heard the saying, happy employees are productive employees, and productive employees are profitable employees. There are many other reasons a workplace investigation should be done. So let's take a scenario. Uh, I want to take a look at a scenario about a complaint that went wrong. Um, so, the scenario that I want to talk about is a story about Rhonda. Um, let's say Rhonda, she's a 22-year-old female, comes to you and accuses Fred, a 56-year-old black man, of making derogatory statements about her because she's an Asian woman. Let's say you don't like Fred and you always thought he was a little smarmy, so you took Rhonda's claim just to confirm what you've, all, you've always known in your head and you report to management that Fred is a troublemaker and you tell them why. Because of what you've told them, management decides to terminate him. A day after the termination, you get a letter from Fred's lawyer threatening to sue you for wrongful termination and discrimination based on age and race. So at this point, you're starting to question if you made the right decision and you start asking around for questions. You go around other coworkers and start asking if Fred has said things to Rhonda, um, if Rhonda was accusing him of. You find that no one can corroborate Rhonda's story, so now you're really irritated and you go to Rhonda, you tell her she's dishonest, she set you up, and you're going to recommend that she be fired. Next thing you know, now Rhonda files a disability claim due to stress and you get a letter from her lawyer claiming retaliation. So hopefully you guys can see where this is leading. This is just an example of why all such claims and complaints should be investigated. It is always risky to jump to conclusions. Or you'll find yourself in this scenario where um, you have an illegal termination, wrongful termination, and then you have caused um, a little bit of stress on a on a on the complaint tent. Okay, now let's look at when to when to conduct an investigation. A workplace investigation is conducted when there is credible information, there may be significant wrongdoing, misconduct, or some ethical lapses. And workplace, and workplace investigation may also be appropriate even when there may have not been specific allegations against an employer department but there have been allegations against others and the investigation is intended 
to exclude the possibility that wrongdoing occurred with the company. Complaints can range from simple policy violations, such as misuse of company property or technology, to some more serious claims like sexual harassment or even drug and alcohol abuse. An effective investigation process protects the interests of the company and its shareholders by preventing and detecting misconduct and violations. Also, ensuring that corporate activities comply with applicable laws and regulations, and identifying areas of improvement for internal business operations. Therefore, an investigation can be conducted simply to uncover sufficient facts to justify a result or to just record somewhere that the incident occurred. Um, it's also very important to record, even if the incident um, may not be as serious, just recording it may help you in the long run if it comes back up in the future. So now let's look at who should be in conducting these investigations. Conducting an effective investigation that can hold up under scrutiny requires Impar um, impartially and objectivity. The people involved have to be confident that the investigator has no stake in the outcome of the investigation. Therefore, it's not a good idea for anyone in a supervisory role, for example, the accuser's manager, to conduct the investigation. Also, conducting a thorough investigation requires the ability to gather as much pertinent information as possible that may not always be easy. So people participating in an investigation must be both defensive or just plain um, scared. The investigator has to be someone who can put people at ease and get them to answer those type of questions. Next, the investigator has to have thorough understanding of the subject matter of the investigation. Uh, the, if an employee alleges sexual harassment, for example, the investigator needs to understand what constitutes sexual harassment in order to ask the right questions and to make the correct determination. Typically, in these cases, the Human Resources Department and any organization is tasked with the uh, duty of conducting a workplace investigation. However, in some instances, a third party can be retained, such as a law firm, a PEO, or other consulting firm can be retained to help with those investigations. Okay, now how to conduct a confidential investigation. As we discussed earlier, it's important to conduct an investigation as quickly as possible but not without some planning beforehand. You don't want to go into the investigation um, unplanned without questions already kind of written down to answer. So when you're confronted with, with an allegation or complaint, it's important to gather uh, first as much information from the accuser as possible. You'll want to know what happened, who was involved, how many times the behavior occurred, dates, times, etc. You will also need to compile a list of witnesses, so be sure to ask the accuser who may have witnessed the inappropriate behavior being alleged. These people will form the core of your investigation. Once all of this has been done, you're going to want to also revisit your handbook. Look at some of the policies to see if there's any policies that have been broken um, based off of the accuser's account of the situation. Um, there could be, uh, there should be policies regarding the behavior of the alleged, whether it's sexual harassment, discrimination, um, you should have a code of conduct policy, a workplace violence policy. Um, make sure you review them and know them all whenever you're investigating. The last thing you want to do once you have everything else is go ahead and develop a list of questions to ask and a little bit later, we will discuss uh, what those questions are. So again, gather all relevant facts, compile a list of witnesses, review all applicable policies and procedures, 
develop questions to be asked, and develop an investigation plan. Documentation. Documentation is always important, and let me tell you why. <laughs> um, it's a must. You must keep accurate notes every step of the way. As we discuss, you'll need the facts and witnesses. Document those things. If during the course of the investigation, other witnesses come to light, you'll want to update the list as well. Also, gather any documents that you find or that are given to you, such as um, maybe emails, letters, notes, anything that relates to the investigation should be kept. Any other evidence, such as physical evidence, evidence must be kept as well. Um, sometimes witnesses will provide information and all of that must be documented. documented. Witness statements or whatever they're telling you should be documented as well. Um, also, once the matter has been concluded, letters will go out to all involved in the investigation. So make sure that you keep record of those that are documented. So all of the above in the slide constitutes a complete investigation file that you will need to gather. Um, this kind of keeps them organized in the file in the event that the conclusion of the investigation or really any part of the investigation is questioned. Additional witnesses or pertinent information comes to light after the investigation has been included. Concluded, um, you have your documentation handy, um, ready to show what you have found if you ever have to argument those things. Uh, if something happens in the future or if it goes to legal. Um, so you want to make sure that you show that you've completed a thorough, effective investigation and that it's a well-organized file is the way to do that. Another kind of tip is whenever you're conducting the investigation, again, make sure that it's done as soon as it happens and that you're documenting um, because sometimes witnesses um, they kind of lose their memory after three or four days have passed. So that's why it's important to start the investigation as soon as possible and document those things that the accuser or the witness said um, just to kind of refresh their memory. If you wait too long, sometimes the statements may not be as accurate. Okay, let's talk about um, conducting the interviews. So. Now that you're armed with the, the information surrounding the investigation, you have your notes, um, you know who you're going to talk to and what you're going to ask them. So now it's time to get started. As I mentioned before, interviews of this nature are generally not pleasant things. Witnesses can be defensive, they can be uncooperative, or they can be just scared. So. It's your job to kind of keep them at ease and comfortable during these types of investigations. The setting is important, believe it or not. Um, the setting can be a conference room, it can be your office, or in some instances, a different location altogether. You should never pop in on an employee at their workstation and surprise them by asking sensitive questions they were not expecting and didn't know were coming. The first thing you need to do is disclose the nature and purpose of the meeting, make appropriate disclosures. For example, let them know who you are, who you represent, and why you're there. Um, I wouldn't beat around the bush. Let's, let's talk about why we're here, who I am, and who I represent. It's very important that you assure the witnesses that there will be no adverse consequences for their participation in that investigation. This is also known as retaliation, and it is probably the thing the witnesses fear the most whenever they're going into an investigation meeting. Retaliation is defined as an adverse action taken against an employee for filing a complaint or participating in an investigation, and it is illegal under federal and some state laws. Retaliation in itself is a form of discrimination. Okay, let's talk about confidentiality. Confidentiality is a tricky thing and that word should be used very carefully and avoided if possible. 
Um, a lot of times confidential comes up in investigations, and let me tell you why it's important to kind of um, not mention that word specifically. Witnesses, of course, they want assurances that they uh, that what they tell you will be kept confidential. But as a practical matter, you can't promise confidentiality because you cannot conduct a thorough investigation unless you are free to share pertinent pieces of information with other witnesses as needed to corroborate or refute a point. What you can do, though, is assure the witness that discretion will be exercised, but make them understand that it will be balanced with the need to conduct a complete and thorough investigation. Again, retaliation is an important point here, so remind them that they are protected from retaliation as often as you need to. Um, on the flip side of the coin, you may not be able to ask them to keep the interview confidential, and there are some things, instances when employees are protected under the National Labor Relations Act from being subject to adverse action if they talk about their working conditions. You can, however, ask for confidentiality if you have a legitimate business justification. These include protecting witnesses, preventing the destruction of evidence, avoiding the fabrication of testimony, and preventing a cover-up. It is best to likewise appeal their common sense and ask them to exercise discretion. So here, according to the board, like I mentioned, you want to be careful when you um, promise confidentiality. Um, so there are some instances where it is um, it's kind of required for it to be confidential, and these are some things that the NLRA, the NLRB, describes as to justify confidentiality, and that could be to protect a witnesses, a wit witnesses that may need protection. Um, whether evidence is in danger of being destroyed, um, a testimony is in danger of being fabricated, whether there is a need to prevent a cover-up, again, um, whether corruption of the investigation would likely occur without confidentiality. Um, so don't take confidentiality completely off the board. However, these things that are bulleted are things that will justify the confidentiality requirement. But I would only use confidentiality if your investigation um, involves some of these bullets, okay? Okay, so conducting confidential investigation. Here are just a few tips on avoiding unfair label practices. Employers should examine um, their existing policies, procedures, and internal forms regarding workplace investigations to determine if there are any blanket confidentiality requirements that may need to be modified based off what we just discussed. Um, employers should ensure that all internal documentation as well as instructions given to investigators are reviewed. Employers should train those individuals charged with conducting workplace investigations on how to identify those circumstances in which a confidentiality instruction is appropriate, how to narrowly tailor any confidentiality instruction in light of this recent decision, and how to most effectively conduct investigations where a confidentiality requirement is not justified. Carefully planning the order of the interviews, conducting simultaneous interviews or conducting interviews in rapid succession may limit the amount of conversation that goes on between interviews. Employers may also consider keeping employees isolated or on administrative leave if warranted until investigators are able to interview them. Ultimately, employers will need to make case-by-case -case assessments to determine whether the business reasons justify confidentiality instructions. Um, so even though many employers will 
likely continue to err on the side of protecting confidentiality. Um, you just want to make sure that you do so with a lot more caution and care. Um, so let's talk about conducting the interview. So let's talk about the questions at hand. Keep in mind that every investigation is different and the questions will have to be tailored to the specific facts of the matter being investigated. That said, the general rule of thumb is to start with some open-ended questions, then kind of narrow the questioning to more specifics as the opportunities present themselves. Or if you find it necessary to do so, the ultimate goal is for the witness to tell you what he or she knows, um, not for you to tell them what you know, otherwise you would be accused of asking some um, leading questions and you could compromise the process. Even though many employers will do that as well, you kind of want to be very cautious with that. Um, some additional questions. Um, that you can start with are um, the date of the incident. And remember, these are kind of general. Where did the specific event occur? Please explain the events that occurred. How did you react to the situation? Were there any witnesses to the specific event? If yes, please provide their names. Is there any physical evidence that supports your complaint? If so, please describe or attach copy of evidence. And um, the most important question is, what is your desired outcome of the investigation? Um, so if you're conducting an investigation, someone either complains or it's most likely it's a policy that they're complaining about, it's always important to ask them, what's your outcome? What's your end goal? So that when we provide a result, we want to share that with the employee, whether it's additional training, um, it's always best to ask what is the desired outcome from that accuser or the complainant. Here are some other general questions, and these are more so geared towards uh, potential witnesses. Um, how is the overall atmosphere in your department, group, or office? How do you communicate with one another? How do you communicate with your supervisor? How does your supervisor communicate with you? Are there any problems or issues at work? Um, if so, what are they? And those are some questions to kind of get you started. So let's look at some common investigation mistakes to avoid. The number one thing, taking sides. That kind of reminds me of uh, our scenario about Rhonda where they kind of jumped to conclusions and ended up with a wrongful termination suit. So taking sides, the investigator must remain neutral and conduct unbiased, objective investigations. Applies equally whether emphasizing or complaining employee or defending conduct of alleged wrongdoer. Again, mentioned confidentiality. Um, never promise confidentiality. Um, that could be a breach of conduct, contract. Uh, must be sure to explain confidentiality if qualified or limited. Um, treat as sensitive information. Share only with legitimate need to know. Failing to document. Minor complaints often go not documented. Relevant documents must be properly dated and signed. Sanitize notes and reports before finalizing. Be proud, be the proud author. So if you're going to conduct investigation and you're documenting, make sure that what you, you're documenting, if it happens to go into um, legal or court claim, um, that it's well written. So you want to make sure that you're the proud author and you don't have any errors in your documentation or it's confusing to read. Failing to actually investigate. Do not simply ask witnesses to provide you with a written account of what happened. Um, that's the number one fail. Make sure you're sitting down with the witnesses versus just 
asking them to write down what happened. Um, it's important to have interactive interviews to assess credibility and immediately follow up on issues raised. Um, this prevents employees from improperly inserting their own subjective opinions and potentially biased beliefs into process. The next one, failing to make conclusions. He said, she said type cases, easy to simply state that no conclusion can be reached. Um, have you ever had a complaint and you didn't hear anything from that manager? Um, it kind of decreases employee morale and it um, makes the employee feel like they can't come to you with a complaint because they made a complaint and they never heard anything after that. Um, so it's important to reach a conclusion based on best information available, credibility of witnesses, a determination of who is more likely to be telling the truth, and it's okay to determine inappropriate conduct without concluding unlawful harassment has occurred. Okay, so now that we've talked about um, some of the questions, common mistakes to avoid, we are now going to discuss how to reach a determination, and I am going to transition this over to my pro-presenter, um, Daniel Mater. Awesome, thank you, Vaughn. All good stuff. Okay, uh, so we're going to go over um, basically how to reach the determination. So um, kind of after all the steps you took earlier that Vaughn was going over, it's time for us to kind of determine what did we find from this investigation. So to kind of start out with, you as the organization, you know, you need to keep a clear paper trail of all the evidence, um, such as examining the documentation, um, any previous behavior and incidents that you've um, witnessed throughout the investigation. Um, you as the investigator should have a clear record of everything done and your findings should take um, into these kind of steps that I'm kind of going to go over right now. Um, so after you gather all your information um, and you've done your investigation, here are the steps you're going to take. Uh, first, you're going to want to start out with um, the initial investigation. So with that being said, what is the situation you were investigating? Was it a harassment claim? Was there a theft in the workplace? Figure out what exactly it is that you were trying to investigate. Um, number two, uh, the parties involved. Um, who was involved? Did you get their statements? Kind of interview them. Figure out exactly who was involved in this investigation that you are trying to accomplish. Number three, your key findings. So with that being said, what did you find in the investigation? What did you get from the interviewing your, um, the parties involved? Everything like that, you're going to want to gather all your key findings together, which will lead you to number four, company policies. So you want to make sure that you uh, check your handbook. Do you guys have an employee handbook that has any policies involving any kind of workplace disputes or anything um, pertaining to what you are investigating? So you want to make sure that the parties involved, maybe sign the invest, uh, sign the acknowledgement for the handbook, anything like that, um, just to make sure that there were no policies that were broken. And then number five is your action plan. So what discipline is needed for the situation? Um, is it possible that maybe you need to suspend the employees, um, any kind of written up notice, possibly a termination um, of that matter? All right, so how to reach the determination. So the goal of the uh, determination document is to ensure that um, basically the court, the jury, the government agency, whatever was involved um, is able to see that you took uh, a good faith effort into um, carrying out the investigation, um, making um, a, a good footprint in trying to um, determine what exactly happened and that you were um, aware of what the employee or the situation was and that you're conducting a thorough and uh, complete investigation. All right, so going into remedies. All righty, so um, once you're the employer, um, you've been conduct conducting your investigation, um, you now need to come up with a remedy for the situation. So depending on the situation um, of what the investigation was would kind of determine the types of actions that you would need to take in this instance. So number one would be counseling. Um, so do the involved people um, need to be counseled on possible behaviors? Is there any kind of uh, possible um, training that needs to be done for them in, um, in regards to how to interact and social norms, anything like that uh, pertaining to counseling the parties involved? Um, next would be retraining or a possible relocation. 
Um, so were the, pro were the employees properly trained on the policies? Um, if it was a harassment uh, issue, do we need to possibly do like a relocation for one of the employees? Um, that's a good remedy to kind of keep in mind in the investigation. Uh, the third would be uh, probation, suspension, or termination. Um, do either of the parties involved need to be written up? Do we need to suspend any of them um, or possible termination? Um, I do want to let you guys know that if you are doing a termination, please keep in mind that uh, terminations can be very risky. Um, so therefore, you don't want to just go and, you know, jump right into it and terminate the employee. You want to make sure that you have firm facts and that um, you have a, a great a decision to uh, terminate uh, one of the parties involved. All right. Uh, next would be uh, monitoring going forward. So uh, no matter how you conclude the investigation, uh, the, the situation can be um, very emotional, disrupted to the workplace. Um, therefore, there are a couple things you want to kind of keep in mind um, and stuff to kind of look out for in that instance. One would be an open door policy. So literally keep an open door policy. Definitely keep your office door open. Make yourself available. Make the um, employees feel happy or um, comfortable to come to you and talk to you, vent whatever reason, whatever is going on um, uh, with them at the moment. Um, next would be visible. So just, you know, literally be visible in the workplace. Uh, take a walk around your facility. Uh, let, the uh, the, let the staff know that you are present. Um, you're here for them for whatever reason. Um, next would be follow up with the accuser. So check in, see how things are going um, with the changes that you made. Um, kind of ask the, the person involved, was there any like, was the situation handled properly? Anything of that nature. Now last would be retaliation. So uh, you want to make sure that the parties involved are not being bullied or feel punished in any way for speaking up um, in regards to whatever happened. Um, you also want to keep in mind that um, it is important to remind all the parties that retaliation does sometimes occur. All right, so we're going to take this over to some question and answers. So if you guys want to go ahead and um, type in your question, if you guys have anything uh, for either Vaughn or myself, and we can um, take a minute here to kind of let you guys ask those questions, and we'll be happy to start answering them. Okay, I don't see that we have any questions and answers. Um, so, Daniel, if you want to out, that'll be yeah. great. Yeah, of course. All right. So, I guess we did a good job. There's no questions. That's fantastic. Um, so, I'm just going to kind of go over it. Um, so, where do you go from here at this point? Um, now, moving forward, you know, you can call your HRC consultant or we have the service center if you want to ask us any questions. Um, if you want to view any additional webinars or any uh, special tools that we do have, you can just visit our website at www.coadvantage.com slash resources. Uh, right down there, you'll see um, the HR services email address. If you have any generic questions, you can um, email the HR team at coadvantage.com. Or if you want to speak to us um, directly, our number is 877-535-5229. And then just to stay up to date on any webinars coming um, coming up in the near future, um, you can register for any upcoming uh, Color Advantage webinars or any past webinars um, by going on to our website again at www.coadvantage.com slash webinars. Um, and just to keep in mind for our next webinar that we hope you guys do attend um, is next month, and it's going to be on the topic of uh, putting breaks on HR mistakes. So something very informative that you guys want to definitely make sure you guys uh, tune in for, and that is going to be happening next month in the month of December. And so on behalf of Vaughn and myself, we want to say uh, thank you guys again for paying attention and listening to us. Um, again, our contact information is all right there, so feel free to reach out to us if you guys have any questions um, if we're paying to anything involving the webinar that we discussed today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. Have a great day. Thank you.